I'm Ben Tran. Uh, I am an associate professor at Vanderbilt University, where I teach in Asian studies uh, and English in those two departments. Uh, and I teach uh, a number of uh, classes and issues and topics, anything from settler colonialism to classes on the Vietnam War, uh, cultural representations of the war, um, and current day Southeast Asia and culture. Welcome to the Vietnamese. I'm your host, Kenneth Nguyen. Being part of a culture of nearly 100 million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history, and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all over the world. Thank you, Ben. What does it mean to be Vietnamese to you these days? To be Vietnamese to me is like, um, it's like a, a sense of home, right? But it's not just nostalgic or a place that I return to, but it's one that requires therapy. It's one that, that causes me to rebel. Uh, it's one that makes me think a lot about the limitations and the possibilities of who I am um, and who now who my kids are. Um, and so it's a touch point, right? But it, it, it's one that is complicated, um, mixed with lots of emotions and, and intellectual thought. Um, and it's, you know, for me, it, it has to continue to keep growing and becoming more dynamic and never become static. Because I think that's when I think it becomes purely nostalgia, I think is when we, we get lost in this romanticized loop that doesn't, um, doesn't portend the complexities of that, of what we call home or what we call Vietnam. Right, um, which is in some many ways changing much faster, I think, or in ways that are unexpected uh, than let's say like Nashville, even though Nashville's changing extremely fast, a lot of construction, but nothing compared to Vietnam, for example. Right. You know, you uh, you you had all this uh, these words that that just flew by me, and all I caught was romanticize. Uh, you said romanticize history or something. Romanticize the loop. Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, you're, shout out, first of all, to your brother, Benny Tran, um, who's a good friend of mine, and we'll have him on the podcast soon. You know, we talk about this stuff uh, quite a bit. And, you know, I always wonder to myself, why are we so stuck, you know, guys in our generation on this Vietnamese scholarship, this Vietnamese uh, identity question? Um, and I'm wondering when is it going to get old and when am I going to burn out on this? But it seems to just keep renewing itself in this <laughs> romanticized loop that you just described. Yeah, I don't, that, that's the thing is that I, I don't, I think that there's so much of it that is contingent and changing and transformative for us, right? As hopefully as our lives continue to progress and change uh, in ways that we cannot anticipate. Right. Um, for example, like, you know, I was, I was thinking about this and initially I thought, man, I'm so Vietnamese, I'm, I'm so special, right? I grew up in the South. I grew up in Atlanta and high school kids, all we did was loiter. We go to late night places, go to IHOP, and I'd be the one kid who'd like order the seafood omelet. And people were like, you're, you're crazy. You know, you're, you're just absolutely nuts, right? Why would you do that? And then I thought, you know, it's what I like. I have a pension for it. My mom tells a story when she was pregnant with me in the refugee camp at Camp Pendleton. Whenever they serve fish, she was like the first one in line. And she said, you know, from the womb, I had a pension for seafood. And I go to Vietnam. And you go to Vietnam, and then it's like seafood galore, right? Like shellfish, fish, all kinds of ways, squid, shrimp, you know, all kinds of ways. I think maybe it's just me being Vietnamese that you know, I'm not so special after all, you know, the Vietnamese folks would order a seafood omelet at IHOP too, if they could. Mm -hmm. And then this last trip, I went back and I was with my kids and we were uh, at Hotai in Hanoi, the biggest lake. And, you know, it's a lake in the city, so it's polluted and, you know, it's not too far from the lake where John McCain's plane fell down and so forth. And we catch this huge catfish. And, you know, I love fishing too, right? And that's part of like, you know, what I did with my dad, it's part of my love for the sea, for, you know, at the water and so forth. And, and, but it's, you know, also part of Vietnamese tradition. And then I pull up this fish. It's huge. It's like a foot and a half, big catfish, bigger than I thought could exist in that lake. 
which, you know, had a fish die off, like, you know, the previous summers, right? Like the, all the fish die in a lake. Um, and then, and then that, that relationship to like fish in the water led me to think about, wow, you know, like the people in Vietnam who've experienced war or a polluted world, right? Where planes fall into their lakes and bombs have kind of destroyed their waters, you know, or dams have done that, or, you know, new lakes have been made from, from bomb craters, right? that Vietnamese people have been living with these issues of environment from the war, right? This is another dimension of the war that then made me really think, you know, change the way that I began to think about the intellectual question of, you know, Viet Vietnamese folks who experienced the war and that kind of atmospheric violence of bombs and chemicals and so forth, that they've been living with this. And what does that mean? You know, they, they kind of, in some ways to experience the war was to be kind of harbingers of the environmental disaster that we live through now. And so when they're like, why'd you throw that fish down? I'm like, why would you eat that fish? Then I think it's not because they're Vietnamese or because they like fish, but maybe they've been living through this for decades now, right? Where life has to continue. And I think eventually all of us will be like the Vietnamese people who have suffered through, you know, war and environmental catastrophe, right? So I think that's what's interesting to me to mm -hmm. make those connections where I think initially, you know, it's just me that I like the seafood oven. I'm special, I'm unique, like a naive high school kid, you know? And then I'm like, oh, maybe it's because, you know, Vietnamese folks live by the water, you know, fresh water, the ocean, all that stuff. And, and then it gets more complex. So for me, you know, there's just these different layers that seem to be infinite um, as time goes on, right? Uh, as history builds up into the present and into the future. And I, and I think that's interesting. Um, you know, like, for example, I think, you know, I, I know that you've been talking a lot about this film, Micah, right? And I, I think like a couple of things, for example, right? One is that it's fascinating that this was like a hit show in Vietnam before so like these these things these these marvels you know nuggets of, of cultural marvel right that were there and uh, that are brought back to life but the other interesting questions to me are like you know um in viet in in vietnamese literature sci-fi is not a dominant or a big genre for example but this seems to be like kind of an exception and then the other question is like why sci-fi now Right, which is like, you know, in Southeast Asia, there's a big boom, even in, in English language literature of sci-fi lit, as there is in China and elsewhere, right? And it's the state of the world that we're in. Right. Um, that the world is changing so quickly that it seems to be an alternate reality to the ones that we're either living in now or we lived in yesterday. That sci-fi as a genre is becoming, is becoming so important and, and how we work through how we experience, how we aestheticize the world as we are encountering it. And I think it's interesting that, you know, Hamtran and Jenny Lee, or they chose, whether or not they're conscious of it or not, a sci-fi genre to depict the next iteration of Vietnamese expression in film, for example. So I think, you know, these things are constantly changing, um, and, but they reflect the changing times. Uh, and, and our time period is one of extreme, uh accelerated transformation yeah <clears throat> i i've never thought about that you you're right there's not a whole lot of sci-fi going on in vietnam mm -hmm. and micah is not really from vietnam not it wasn't somebody inside of vietnam that thought of the concept of of this character micah it's like i think it's 1978 Czechoslovakia yeah. production TV TV production coming out of that part of the world was you know syndicated brought into Vietnam and mm -hmm. you know showed as a rerun uh, in Vietnam so it's not even the origination coming from from Vietnam and Ham uh, has mentioned this many times before Ham Tran the director of Micah has said that the 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 
the comedies and the uh, sitcoms and, and romantic comedies that are coming out of Vietnam, that can continue forever. But we need to create like a new, a very new way of looking at, you know, life in Vietnam. And that's why he's chose to do Micah and he did a Bitcoin heist. So he's constantly trying to uh, insert these new ways of looking at uh, Vietnamese life uh, from, from a different lens. I mean, I think that's, I think this is a really important point, right? Is that, that Michael was made during the Cold War behind the Iron Curtain and then brought to Vietnam in that context, right? In, in a socialist yeah. second world context, second to third world context. And so I, I think that's, that's really interesting because w- what Hama is doing is that there is a sense of, yes, this is a Vietnamese expression now, but it resonated with the Vietnamese audience during that time period. And that's what I meant, right? It's like, right. yes, it is Vietnamese, but it's not, it doesn't have to be, a, it doesn't have to be originally Vietnamese. Vietnamese, because I don't even know what that means, right? Because there's so much influence, you know, through the region, with China, through Southeast Asia, through other routes that we don't know about that form into or inform this Vietnamese expression. And I think, but but that's the everyday experience is that all these influences come and we experience it that way. We can't anticipate it or we don't know about it yet, right? And so for me, as like a literary critic or a cultural critic, to un- to study this, to undo as much as I can, to study and to f- discover and to reveal and to figure out the different layers, I think for me is, is what's significant. And it, it doesn't get old, right? Because yeah. that when you say like, you know, Vietnamese people, this is how you should eat for, it's authentic this way, no vegetables, no hoisin sauce, no sriracha, old school. That's, that's not gonna be it, right? So this question of authenticity for me or the, origins of something are not as interesting to me as the different routes with which a story like Micah could take on, right? I mean, if you, if you think about the circuit of, you know, it's being produced in, it's being, you know, everything is produced in Vietnam, shot in Vietnam, but the aesthetics and the, infer, you know, uh, uh, a U.S. trained filmmaker goes back to Vietnam to make it with his sensibilities is, is, is what makes it interesting, right? Yeah. As a different iteration of Vietnamese, um, Vietnamese art or Vietnamese film. Some people will say it's not Vietnamese, right? Or, you know, like some of the audience members are like, wow, you know, this is, the kids are Western or the kids are, or whatnot. Um, but I think that the confluence, right, of these waves of cultural influence is what's interesting. Yeah, and you know, Internally, this was a big debate and a big issue that we had. Uh, Ham was very proud of the English dub that he directed. Uh, right. You know, this came much later. Uh, the film was completed. Ham uh, was given an opportunity to make the English dub. And he did a great job with the actors, you know, all Vietnamese, uh, except for the main character. She was Indonesian. And we had the copy of the English dub. And as we were going out to distribution, we were figuring out which theaters and in what context were we going to release the English dub. And it was so interesting on the back end how the conversations played out. Because on one end, I felt like we were having dialogue within each, you know, within the team, inside the team about how the world is kind of watching movies and wanting the original sound which is the original language you know like squid games you know to watch squid games and the english dub version is weird you know so we're talking about all this stuff and and it was hard because you know as you know and i know we have young kids that just check out they're watching you know a vietnamese language film even though it's a kid's film they're checked out and so ham you know having this english dub Guys like me and Ham were just pushing for the English dub to be playing at the theaters. And then the other side of the team was like, no, 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 no. You know, Hollywood is not about that. It's about the reckoning and, you know, about bringing original language to make it normal and normalize it. The phonetics of Vietnamese and how beautiful the. So Mm. this debate was constantly within two weeks of of, of the release uh, Mm -hmm. being played out in our internal uh, team. Yeah, but I think those questions are hard, but, you know, I, I think in the, in your podcast with 
Jenny and Ham. I, I think it was first of all, this is if it's directed towards kids, it's really hard for them, right? I remember yeah. taking my nieces and nephews to uh, a dis uh, like a some some Disney film in Vietnam, and I was kind of you know I'd been living there for over a year, and I was I was excited to take them and to listen to an English language film, a Disney film, and then I go in there and parents, <laughs> Vietnamese parents are reading the subtitles for their kids and so like in the in the entire movie theater there's this constant chatter of, of Vietnamese reading um but you know what 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 what's like I said like the interesting thing about this is that there are different and this is what I've been thinking about a lot recently with my literary dubbing project but what does it mean to address what does it mean for an aesthetic work to be in the language of the audience and not of the characters. I haven't, you know, and and I haven't seen Micah yet, so I haven't had a, you know, um, I haven't had a chance to see it. Um, but that that is the interesting question. I, and I don't, and when, when we say that, we tether it to like when, when you're having that debate, there are some assumptions that are there. In other words, like the Vietnamese language is this origin, right? Even though the Micah story is not originally Vietnamese, but it should stay true to the Vietnamese characters. And there's a certain monolingualism that is assumed there. There's a certain, um, na- you know, mother tongue assumption that is there. But if you think about like Quốc Ngữ and the changes that go through that, I mean, the phonics came in right from Latin, and then the Vietnamese language negotiates that and engages with it, and it changes the way that we, of course, it changes the way that we we begin to speak, right? Um, and then, you know, throughout Vietnamese history, there's always been other languages, right? Uh, Chinese, French, Russian, English, uh, and, and, you know, we, we don't know what the next languages will be. So Vietnam has always been uh, a multilingual society, right? Where Vietnamese has not always been the only language, of course not, right? Um, and so... I think those negotiations are important. Those questions are important to ask, but I, I don't think that they should be limited to, to this notion that there's this like a mother tongue that is yeah. natural, but rather it's historical. It has a history. It has changed because of other languages, one. And it also has changed because of things like the Latin alphabet, the Romanized alphabet or the printing press. And now as we move on, in the digital world. I mean, the, even the way that we type our keyboard with the Vietnamese diacritics will ultimately affect and transform the language, right? And so there's 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 no pure Vietnamese language that we can preserve. I mean, that's we've talked about this, right? It's like yeah. the 1954 diaspora who goes from the north to the south in the United States, we still speak that 1954 Vietnamese, but it stood still in time. Right. In some ways, we have we have our own version, things like your house or computer or, you know, you guys are talking about analog and digital. You just say it. Right. But in but, you know, and then you hear in Vietnam, they have like they have words for, the you know, my uh, thing or, you know, they have the language has to change because of the world around it. Right. Um, so I think it would be hard to pinpoint like an authentic Vietnamese language that way. If we, yeah. if we were to assume it. Uh, ben, I want to go back into your history. Uh, I'm interested in how people become academics and why people become academics. And at what point in your life, I mean, you know, we all grow up and we're playing with toy trucks and we're playing with airplanes and, you know, we're like video games and we just go through life sort of in our early years playing, right? But at what point does it take, you know, this sort of seriousness and what triggers this sort of path? I know I, it must be a very slow and gradual path, but that you're like, okay, well, I want to go into academics and I want to learn about learning. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think for me, it's, it's a love of books and narrative and literature. I mean, I grew up, um, my parents were great storytellers and, um, we read a lot and my dad was all, always interpreting stories and narratives, right? He'd be like, okay, this is what this can be about, but this is what also this can be about. And then 
we were latchkey kids. And back then we went to a school and my parents were working and we, we couldn't afford, like there was no after school program. Uh, and so we just went to the public library and we were told to sit there and do our homework and wait until my parents had come pick us up. And I ended up reading like the entire local public library um, as a kid growing up. And then I didn't think about it much. I went, I went to college, I graduated, I started a company, a, a, a graphic design slash advertising company, launched our own art magazine called Blue Milk. And then I decided, I was like, this is not work for me. I mean, part of this is, you know, enough uh, running, running the business was not what I wanted to do anymore. So, wait, so I applied for a Fulbright. How old, you, how old were you then? I was graduated from college. So 21, 22, 21 and blue milk and all of that at 21. Yeah. You have this, like, I'm not, I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. I don't want to do this anymore. I, I applied, I applied to go back to Vietnam to, to work on like Vietnamese poetry. Um, and I went to, I applied for the Fulbright. I got it, uh, a research Fulbright. And then I was lucky enough to get it. And then I went to Vietnam and, and sat in literature classes and studied in, in Saigon um, and then I came back and this is what I wanted to do. Um, and then I applied for Complet at Berkeley and, uh, you know, I just wanted to read and write. Um, I love reading and I love writing. And so, you know, that's the path that I chose. Um, and I, I also believe in teaching, right? Like teaching to me is important. I've had very formative teachers in my life. Um, and, you know, teach, of course, teaching at the university level is different than teaching at elementary K through 12. Um, but these are the things that, that, um, that kind of drove me and, and some of the intellectual questions that I'm still trying to work through or understand, uh, certain things, um, that are pressing to me or significant to me or, um, you know, is, is why, I, why I do this. And, you know, I'm still learning, right. I, I still learn from my students, um, next semester I'm teaching a new, you know, a, a new class of freshmen, um, and I will learn from them. And so I'm very fortunate that way that, um, and I also like the university setting, right? <laughs> like, I like, I like the energy. I like the youthful energy, you know, um, I like the banter. I like the, the background noise. Um, and I like the intellectual community for me. That's really important. Wow. This is uh, amazing. So you're like 22, 20, like 22, 23, when you sort of sort of wandering into the setting of, of, of academics and, and poetry. And because it sounds like up until then, you know, through your formative years, high school, college, it wasn't really like, I want to be a professor. I want to, you know, teach. I want to figure out this uh, side of academia. Yeah, I knew I wanted to do something with literature, right? Like I knew whether or not that was like reading literature and being a critic or writing and studying it and studying its history or becoming like a, a novelist or something. I knew that I wanted to do something with literature. Um, and, and part of the, the literary arts magazine was partly that, uh, you know, a kind of, uh, that was an attempt to do that. But, you know, besides starting a restaurant, there's nothing harder to do in terms of business, in terms of business success than running a, a literary arts magazine. Yeah. Um, when you decided to go back to Vietnam in those years, didn't your, your parents, did they warn you again? going back so early to, to study Vietnamese? Yeah, so that was, I was the first or second cohort of Fulbrighters to go back to Vietnam uh, because the program was suspended uh, after the war. Um, and so, I mean, for, for Vietnam itself. And back then the Fulbright program, you know, it was just rebooting. And... My parents, I, and, and the thing is you need like a university or, or like a institute to sponsor your application. And, you know, the go-to places typically would be Hanoi. And my parents were like, ah, we don't, we don't, because at that point, no, a few people have been back to Vietnam, especially in Atlanta. Maybe right. people in California had been going back somehow. What, right, what year was that? But they had no idea. Uh, this was in, so I applied, this would be in like 19... Um, 99, 2000, right? Um, and so, you know, well, it might already happen, but, you know, people were not f going back that frequently. And then uh, I applied to the a, a university in Saigon. Um, 
for the social sciences and humanities university and I, and I, and I applied and, and, you know, my parents were like, why are you, <laughs> why are you going back to Vietnam to Vietnamese university to study? And I just wanted to do it. I wanted to work on my Vietnamese um, because I, you know, I'd, I'd been to England and Ireland to study English drama and poetry and I wanted to do this in Vietnam. Yeah. I can't imagine what that, what that experience was like. Um, and it today, you know, we look back on, um, going to Vietnam as a, such a normal thing. I mean, it's not completely normalized yet, but it's, it's a normal, fairly normal thing now to go back and, you know, uh, be integrated, it, whether it's business or academics that we go back and, and partake and filmmaking. Uh, mm -hmm. And we are blending into the world there and vice versa. It's all like happening right now. Right. I mean, I think it's, that's what's really interesting, right? Is like, this is part of the globalization process that's happening. And things are changing dramatically. Um, uh, and, you know, and it's just not people traveling, right? But it's ideas and yeah. languages and songs and narratives and films. I mean, everyone's, you know, people are watching Squid Game and there are certain narratives that are going back and forth. On, on In some ways, it's great. But in some ways, it's it can get homogenous, right, if, we, if we're not careful. Yeah, and that's a thing that I, I think about a lot and talk about a lot, this idea of homogeneity it's like if we are going back and forth a lot and we are normalizing our american culture with vietnam and bringing back this way of looking at things that are very western and vietnam's mm -hmm. taking it in and ingesting it and or even korea korea is having a big effect on on the cultural um production of vietnam and things are changing and it's becoming the world is coming becoming more homogeneous in culture and it it's alarming to me a little bit yeah i mean i think you know for me one of the interesting things is like i mean i think one of your podcasts talked about the gentrification of vietnam not only that but it's like the suburban suburban home goes to vietnam or to southeast asia right yeah. which to me like a suburban suburban home is like cookie cuttery american post-world war ii setting yeah but that for some people that's the ideal right that that's the that's you know you have a backyard and you know an hoa whatever, whatever that may be oh, yeah. uh but I, I think it's interesting to go back and to see like some aspects of like american suburban architecture in certain developments in vietnam or then you have like that kind of ideal but through an indonesian developer right that's gentrifying and developing the land um and so I think there's that. And then there's also like, you know, every place is going to have a Muji store and a yeah. Uniqlo and, you know, McDonald's, um, you know, places that you'll find in New York, you know, you'll, you'll find in, in every major city. And so that, I mean, that squeezes out certain places. But, you know, when I go back to Vietnam now, I really um, appreciate like the stalls of food that have been there. And, and this is like, partly nostalgia and partly resistant resilience right like like some of those people have been serving up that food like through the war after the war you know through this entire period of like all that rent going up um but you know this brings us the questions of like housing and how expensive things have gotten and what does that mean for people and where are people living and how will the infrastructure continue to build you know um I think these are issues that, you know, that I know that in California is a big issue. It's a big issue here in Nashville, but it's also a big issue in in, in Hanoi and, and, you know, cities throughout Vietnam. You have two very uh, distinct scholarship trajectories. And one of them is this, this idea of the right to breathe. Mm -hmm. And it's an actual area of study that you're, uh, you've, you've really been working on. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so the, the story started out because I was interested in, in, in atmospheric violence and what it means to use the air as a medium for bombs and chemical weapons. Um, and of course, a lot of that, you know, that began in World War I uh, and even earlier, much earlier in different forms, but, you know, that um, even the Roman, Roman times in, in Chinese dynasties, Chinese warfare, they would like use particular gases, but not to re, not in the way that, that the atmosphere could be re-engineered 
mm. and to be used in a particular way. Um, what some people have called uh, Admiral Terrorism. Um, and so I was going to go back to Vietnam and do research on, on that and look at, you know, how the Vietnamese filmmakers from the ground, you know, film B-52s flying over them. Uh, what were some of the ways in which people understood that, that, that terror that came from the air? And then when I was there, the air pollution was in Hanoi was really, really bad. Um, and it was an issue. It was an issue when we left. And we had talked to some friends who, um, scientists who, who were like, you know, um, it is an issue, but it, it's like, you know, the 19 U.S. cities in the 1970s. Right. And, you know, and you go back to Vietnam and, and some people are like, you know, I talked to some people, colleagues in Vietnam and they were like, you know, this is part of our development. You know, we'll, we'll be polluted and then, but we'll be like Taipei or Seoul soon, right? Like it'll clean up. This is growing pains. And then I go, and then, and then we go back to Vietnam. Air pollution is terrible. We're wearing gas, not gas masks, but masks all the time. The kids go to school with masks, like on the bus, and it's it's this, the reality that people are living with. And then Hong Kong happens, and I just remember like tear gas. You know, the police would hold up these huge signs that says, "You know, tear gas is being deployed," and then they would, you know, tear gas the protesters. And then COVID happens, and you know, this question of, you know, virus free air, uh, especially when I get to the United States, because in Asia, everyone masks up already, right? And trained and so forth, especially during the flu season. And then it's, I go back, to, I come back to the US and it's like, people are just thinking like, that, you know, it is my right to wear or not to wear a mask without thinking about people's airspace, right? To be virus free. And then I was, then, um, you know, I and a number of other scholars have been thinking about like, what does it mean that the air is our, is our necessary resource for life for both humans and non-humans, right? Plants need air, animals need air, um, that it is being used or by other people, right? All the time, right? It could be like, you know, factories releasing their, their, their fumes, right? Um, or states using tear gas, like, governments using tear gas to quell protesters or, you know, the airspace that they use during war. I mean, there's flight, you know, there's airspace in terms of flight and so forth. And so, you know, I've, I've, I've worked in the, on the history of colonialism and decolonialism. And right now I feel like with all that, that happened, right? <laughs> aerial warfare, air pollution, um, you know, and then COVID, right. Uh, it seemed like, this is the last resource that we have, but most of us are living in, most of the world is living in polluted air uh, or breathing polluted air all the time. And so um, I'm trying to uncover the kind of history of that. And then, like I said before, there are people who've experienced this previously, be it through war or because of zoning. Uh, you know, typically they build these like polluting factories or next to poor neighborhoods or in the United States. Redlining has an effect on African American communities, not in terms of cutting the highways right through their neighborhood, but then those neighborhoods that are still adjacent to those highways have been breeding this, basically the fumes from the highways for all these years. You know, LA is a great example, right? Like, yeah, there's a high level be, of cancer that yeah. for people who are living right they, by these freeways happen. Exactly, right? So when we when we talk about these things, we typically talk about like, okay, this is like, we're taking over people's land, that's messed up. But the, the long-term effect, right, uh, what has been called like the slow violence of this is the asthma and the can lung cancer that might happen or, and all these other complications, medical complications that shorten people's lives, right? Um, because the air has not, their air has not been respected, right? Their air has not, is not clean. Their air has been taken over, right? And the hard thing about air is that it's like ephemeral. It, it's not ephemeral, but it's flowing. It's, it's, it's going across boundaries. It's not like land where you demarcate it, right? But the air circulates. <clears throat> and so how do we think about that? Um, so, so that's the question of, of this project. And then to, to, to see how people have written about it, how they've lived with it. Um, and so when you dig back into the literature or in art, these are, these are questions that um, artists and writers and intellectuals have been thinking about for a while now. So I'm just trying to pull all that together. 
um, and put forth a, a particular way of understanding it. So, so there's a lot of abstract ideas that are being sort of like propped up and, you know, they pop, they're popping up as you're living life and you're paying attention and you're seeing these, uh, from somebody who's just, you know, really observant and, you know, you start to write them down and the abstract sort of picture starts to come into, to, 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 uh, to focus. How do you develop a thesis behind the information that you've gathered now? Like, are you at that point yet? Um, cause I can imagine like a convention, like, uh, the Geneva convention pulling this academic thought out from, you know, this professor, um, Ben Tran and, you know, saying, quoting, but it comes it, at some point it becomes formed. So it, forgive me because I am kind of making, trying to make sense of it in my brain. Where does it go from here with a lot mm -hmm. of ideas that you have and yeah. then you kind of structure it um, almost to, it's not weaponize is not the right word, but sort of like to, to form it into where like a convention, like a war convention or these ideas can be used right. to actually defend and offend or use for offense right. or whatever that people need. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's abstract. I would say it's like we can't see it, right? And, the, and you know, the thing about air is that we can't feel it or, see, I mean, when it's really fresh, right? Or we say, ah, oh, I feel the fresh air in the mountains. It's either we come from the city and, and that becomes palpable. But it, it's not so much abstract as that we live in a world where we can't see things. We can't understand things, right? Like we, they don't, like right now, every, every minute, there's hundreds and hundreds of economic transactions that no mathematician or economist can like sit and parse out because it's happening so quickly through machines or x-ray machines or um we can't see the air we breathe but we can sure as hell feel it right yeah, my apologies uh, i didn't i didn't mean that yeah. to be abstract right 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 but in terms of in yeah. terms of like the abstract ideas and how i do that part of it is that i like right now i'm i'm writing about this great artist um vietnamese artist vietnamese american artist Thornton andrew nguyen who lives in Saigon now, um, but he's been dealing with like um, objects from the war and how people live through through um, these environmental, you know, the war, particularly through the, the violence of the air. Uh, and he tells narratives and creates art from there, right? So I, I, I will pick up some of his ideas and then I will kind of filter, filter and some of my thoughts and work with some of his ideas um, to kind of build, stand on other artists and intellectuals and voices that happen. And then, then you look at like, you know, you talk about these, like, like let's say some kind of Geneva con convention, or, you know, those have been important because, you know, they, they could, you know, outlaw chemical gases, chemical weapons in warfare, but then how does that come to bear that police, domestic police, in Asia, Africa, United States, the UK can use that chemical, that chemical tear gas in order to quell protesters, right? So then that is a that is not an abstraction of ideas, but you understand how particular um, lobbyists or you know people who are interested in promoting the use of tear gas begin to kind of bend things. Like so, for example, like in, in Britain to use it in the colonies they would use tear smoke instead of tear gas, right? These what's rhetorical the twists. What's the difference? Well, the difference is that tear gas sounds like chemical gases for chemical weapons, where smoke, tear smoke seems a little bit more benign, right? But it's the same. So this same is substance. semantics. Yeah, it is. Well, that's, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so, you know, for example, like, even when they they justified it using it in Vietnam during the war, they were like, "Oh, this is to target the insurgents, right?" Um, but it doesn't it doesn't work that way. You put tear gas in, it's going to affect everybody. It's right. going to affect everything in its path, right? Everything that it reaches, it affects. So there's no way that you can parse out say, "Oh, this is an insurgent and this is a good guy." Yeah. I mean, the that is they're going to be fine, but the humans are. Yeah, it's just impossible. Yeah, right. And so and so part of that is the. To, to, to uncover a history of these semantics, rhetorics, uh, and politics that go behind all this. And then to say, hey, this is what, this is what was said. You know, how can we 
like remedy this or how can we think about it differently, right? Um, you know, why is it that like in the United States, if you, you know, in terms of airspace, you know, you treat, you know, the, the you can't shoot a bullet into a neighbor's airspace technically, right? Or an airport, you know, can't fly, you know, at a certain um, height, you know, within your domestic airspace. But then how can, how can people's airspaces when they're protesting not be respected, right? Those are interesting questions to me um, and how we think about that. Um, it does come back to race. It does come back to class. It comes back to even gender. Um, but these are, these are the questions that, that, that are significant to me. And so they're, they're abstract ideas uh, because part, partly because you know, we're dealing with things that we can't see uh, or processes that we can't see or histories that, that have been understudied. Um, and then I bring them to, 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 to bear. And, and do you need to form sort of a thesis going forward or um, are, you, are you just saying that these are, are the components of this idea? And uh, I mean, do you take, does it take a direction, you know, when you point out all these things? And it has a, it has an argument or a thesis, right, to contribute to the conversation yeah. that is happening, right? So I will basically be in conversation with artists and intellectuals <coughs> that come before me, and I want to add to that conversation, and that's the direction, right? Um, that's where we want to go, um, and I'm, I, I want to think about this and and to just to explicate. Right, because what the chemical weapons industry does is it explicates the it understands how the air works, understands what the air could do, the atmosphere. Um, and I too, as an intellectual, want, wants I want to explicate that history and what has been done to our air, for example, right? Um, and how we need to think about it. Because so if we don't do this, I feel like. Yeah. Too much of it goes assumed, and this is how the world is. And, and you could say, like, this is de this is economic development. Yeah, these, these are growing pains, right? This right, this is public policy. Right, this is public policy, and you know. But the really interesting thing too is that, you know, if you know, with these companies now, right, using these resources, uh, or the state using these resources, you know, who who is the one to? collectively stand up for people and clean air, right? The, the, the public common good, because that's what air is, right? That's something we've taken for granted. Um, you know, these, these are issues, for example, that have to do with, you know, water rights. Um, but the air is all around us, we definitely need it. Uh, same thing with water. Um, but, you know, this, this is, I think, used in so many different ways. You know, the, the, the work that you do with this air, you know, this air topic, uh, is one slither of so many other topics that are happening in developing countries like Vietnam. If you, people like you don't do this and are not thinking about it, it's very easy for corporations and governments to sort of just sweep it under the rug and just abuse. This is a, mm -hmm. a common thing. And I think this is one point uh, in the discussion in the developing world of Vietnam water is another thing that you know we don't hear much often about but it's the same idea right uh, there's a flow of, of of river water that's coming in from china that's it's being blocked and being controlled mm -hmm. and that can starve off mm -hmm. millions of people in the mekong right. and that's not really prevalent in the mm -hmm. discussions and the narratives that we're talking about when it comes to vietnam so it's so important to have these kinds of discussions with academics and, and intellectuals like yourself? Yeah, I think for me, part of what's important is to, to like, there are people who are living the, this every day, right? These are everyday experiences um, for, for many people, um, particularly people who are disadvantaged, who are poor, um, who live, you know, in the countryside or in these areas. And I think part of it is that I've, I've learned from them, um, you know, from the literature, from the songs, um, from the thinking, from the ways in which people live. Um, and, and so I, I, part of it is I want to amplify these issues or these everyday aspects, right? Um, and that's what I'm trying to, um, to, to get at, right? Is that 
you know, like I said, like Vietnamese people have been living through a lot of this environmental catastrophe since the war, right? Um, and they've had to cope with it. They've had to come up with ways of explaining it, the resilience of living on, you know, um, through, you know, the trauma to the physical deformities to um, the reproductive issues that, that, that particular regions or areas or families might have. Um, people have been living with it and they, and they think about it a certain way and they get by. And I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a resilience that I think is, is really admirable that I try to learn from in, in that respect, right? And so, um, but I, I, I think increasingly, to me, this is kind of a pessimistic view, but this is the definition of climate change is that it's going to affect all of us in one way or another, more of us, I should say more of us as time goes on. And so, you know, in, in some ways, you know, people have thought about this, you know, it, it, same thing with, you know, Laos and Cambodia who have also experienced these bombings too. It's not just the Vietnamese folks, right? And so there are ways that people, you know, how do they remember this? How do they build monuments to this? How do they make sense of this? How, how, how do they rally against this? How do they advocate against this? How do they tell the story? Um, I think those are significant things that we can learn. Yeah, you know, these things are happening and uh, in order for them to be recounted and retold, it, it requires words. It requires people who put these thoughts into actual words and to define them very clearly. And that's uh, another part of your scholarship. Another part of your journey is this idea of um, literary dubbing, right? The, mm -hmm. um, can, can you talk about that? The original, the, the mother tongue and how it's being um, the loss of it or the renewal mm -hmm. of it or how it's changing constantly through uh, generational passing down? So literary dubbing is a is a con, you know is a concept in which uh, a cat the the language of representation in a literary work is not the language of the character's speech or thought, right? So in other words, the language addresses the audience, right? So if it's a Vietnamese American novel written in English, and let's say it's based in half in like like Ham Trans movie, right? Like yeah. <laughs> half in Vietnam half in the United States, right? The half in Vietnam is going to be in English. So the characters, it's like film, right? This is the, the term dubbing comes from film. Um, it, it addresses the audience, but it does not accurately represent, right? The language that is being spoken by the characters. And so, you know, what happens when you and I speak in English, we don't go through the awkward dance of, you know, sung toi or, am we definitely won't say thou you know and then you know you you, 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 you got right um and so that that whole dimension is, is missing right and that's a significant part of the vietnamese right. language and so that comes across with that but like i said you know the, I, I the question of authenticity for me are interesting but but only one question of many questions and so as we live in this globalized world where english and google translate and you know, a lot of this has to do with machine translation and development of that technology that we accept, right? Um, Anglophone novels to represent like places like Vietnam, where English is one of many languages, not one, but it becomes the dominant, it could become the dominant mode of representation. And I think the you know, your your team who's like, oh, we can't dub for Micah, this is the issue, right? Like this becomes the dominant mode. Where our kid, like our kids are watching, like ah, English, Vietnamese, they yeah, can't. Yeah. There's there's no dissonance for them, even right. if they don't understand Vietnamese. And so I think you know I'm trying to you know I'm trying to you understand this literary phenomenon. It's a technique, um, how it came to be and why it came to be to explain what we now might call global English or world lit taken as you know, English language works um, because English language is the dominant language. Um, but like I said, there are, there are precedents to this too. Like, you know, there are French authors who, Vietnamese authors who write in French. Um, of course, there are Vietnamese American uh, writers who write in English representing Vietnam. Um, but you know, like um, 
there are novels coming out from Vietnam from Viet young Vietnamese writers who are written in English. And this translation during the writing process is occurring, right? And you know, you, you know the Vietnamese language enough to know that there, there are many things that can be lost and gained in this translation during the writing process. And so it's this translation that happens with the writing that I'm interested in, 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 in thinking about. And uh, yeah, and there's, there's levels to all this too, right? I mean, there's like a political slant because when you are, you know, when we, even when we're working on, you know, uh, translating films or something, we are trying to be mindful of this sort of political ingestion from the United mm -hmm. States, Vietnamese American community, because mm -hmm. we don't want to set off certain triggers, right? Words. And so, the actual translation could be skewed a certain way because of what mm -hmm. we think is going to be offensive in the United States, Vietnamese American culture. And, and even though it's not particularly offensive in Vietnam in a, in a certain political way, but it could be misrepresented in a certain way. In, in, and that's just on the political side. Right. Yeah. The, I mean, these are the, I mean, I'm interested in that. These are the different di dimensions of language and literature, right? Like you don't want to translate and say, translate police as con man, but you want to say king sap, right? Because, because one is associated with the police yep. in, in, in communist Vietnam, and one is associated with the police in like, you know, the Republic, right? The South Republic. And so the, there are ways in which this happens that signify a, a particular political slant, right? And so when we, let's say, for example, we talk about, you know, uh, Asian literature that comes from, like from the diaspora who were trained in the United States, from writers who were trained from the United States, that are taken to be represented. So, like Filipino novels or Cambodian novels, where writers could have studied at uh, the Iowa writing, Writers Workshop, right? That is a particular Cold War politics in that study of the craft, right? And this is something that Viet and I have talked about. Um, that is very, very different than the way that an Indonesian or Filipino writer in the trained in the Philippines, trained in you know the Philippines or or wherever may have a different slant to it, right? And so, you know, part of it is that there's these divergent histories before globalization during the Cold War, where cultural systems of understanding of literary literary production were very, very different. But now it's 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 a particular mode. That's a lot to unpack. It's a lot to unpack. Do, do you think do you think that eventually this is going to be a clumsy awkward question but do you think that eventually all language in a few hundred years is going to be just one big mother language and all the nuances is going to be gone and we're just because the dominance of the internet and the globalization of thought that we're all going to sort of be on one plane we're just going to kind of understand the world in one certain a certain language it's not like no longer this idea of dubbing or or you know yeah. it's just going to be one homogeneic language way of communication I, I it's, it's already happening right there are many languages that are disappearing right uh dialects languages that are disappearing i know that you know i have colleagues who are working very hard to preserve particular languages um but it it, this dubbing or this, this automatic, in other words, literary dubbing is like an automatic translation. It's already happening, right? Like, I think this happened during the World Cup, right? Where like, it's like Google Translate, man. People are talking through it and they like talking to the phone and they show it. You know, people are dating, they're having sex, they're having beers, they communicate, you know, people like, people like from Brazil speaking Portuguese to some like, you know, somebody from Eastern Europe, they can communicate. So there is a beauty in that, you know, what comes from it, what's lost, what's gained. There will be, I think, both, but I think the way in which these, you know, these translations are beginning to happen through these machines, through, through these like Google Translate, for example, people use it all the time when they travel, right? You, you see it in Vietnam. Um, uh, there, there's that. But then I think of like, I think of the complexities of like some, some of the, you know, some of the, some of the, the young kids that I encounter in like northern Vietnam, the Hmong kids. Who like they speak like French, Italian, Russian, Hebrew, English, and then like their worst language is like Vietnamese, right? So it's like this, you know. 
you you never know what's going to happen. Um, but I do think that that languages will be lost. Um, but I think there's some things to be gained. Um, what the balance is, how that plays out, is is going to be uh, an interesting one. And I, you know, for example, like I, I think about like somebody like Jokho, and you know, this is the kind of resilience that I really admire. Right? Like here's a person who, like, I love that interview because you know the gap in his education, auto not autodidact, but like self motivated, autodidact, learning music not formally trained, gives up his Berkeley possibility. And then he's navigating this ana- the world between analog and the digital world. Like he, but understanding it very well before many people understood it, like that the satellite can do, satellite TV through the diaspora can do something very different. And so he's negotiating and navigating that, but always like the music's still beautiful, man, you know? And there's something about that that I really appreciate where like sometimes I'm like, Man, I'm cynical and pessimist. Like this, you know, I'm I'm tired of Unique Low. I'm tired of Muji. It's all the same. This new poppy music sounds terrible. And partly, maybe I'm just getting older and like I'm resistant to change. But like when I hear him talk, and he's been through so many changes, right? This is what's remarkable to me. Right? He's been so through so many changes, through so many like different sets of like historical periods, settings, educational settings, musical settings. When he's like, I'm going home to listen to a vinyl, just you know, stairway to heaven. I'm like, whoa, you know, not what I, I expected him to say. Exactly. Right. And I didn't expect, but there's a certain openness, right? And I think to me, some of these artists that I look up to, they're so open and they're so like, you know what, man, let's just roll with the punch. You know, part of it is like, we're gonna roll with the punches. We have to, or we have no choice, right? And then you know, when he was talking about vinyl and you were talking about vinyl, it's like, you know, but there's still something about that analog that I still yeah. appreciate. But that's, like you said, that's a full circle, like going around, around. And so change is inevitable. It's happening quickly. You know, I do think this will be some things lost. Um, and, you know, we talked about this last time uh, during a conversation, but like, you know, with the international schools and the globalization of education, English is the dominant language and, and some of that will be lost. I mean, the future iterations of Vietnamese lit, some of that increasingly more so will be in English. We're beginning to see that already, right? So of course there's some things that are lost. But no. they're like audiences to be I mean this is the I mean the same questions that your team had with Micah, right? Like these are the like global access, you know, tell more of the story. There's more to the story than just the language. I mean these are difficult questions. That I'm constantly grappling with. I don't have an answer to necessarily, right? But these are the questions that I want to address. You know, I I really, really love that conversation with Juk Hall. And I love even more the fact that you brought it up and you listened to that. That's one of my proudest uh, moments in the Vietnamese side, the Vietnamese mm-hmm. language side of, of, of the podcast because um, <clears throat> I was able to talk to somebody that uh, I didn't know that, you know, Asian Entertainment, Paris by Night, these are companies and and and, and uh, studios that uh, I'm particularly, I don't listen to their music much because I think I've always thought that it's just sort of like trapped in, in, a, in a specific time period. But I've, you know, there obviously there's great songs that have come from it, but I don't, um, I, I just didn't think that somebody like Chuk Ho existed until I talked to him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was very naive on my part. I, but I tried to go in with an open mind. And, mm-hmm. and we started talking about Ennio Morricone. And we spent mm-hmm. a lot of time, you know, on Ennio Morricone and, and different foreign language films. And uh, it, makes me, it makes me realize how um, the conversation with people like Chuk Ho, where we we think initially that they're a certain way that they're just producing music a certain way. But the reality is you could see he's stretching and he's trying to uh, bring out music, Vietnamese music in a, in a, in a different and fresh way and incorporating different techniques from the Beatles. He's, he mentioned, and uh, Mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff he goes, he steals from Ennio Morricone and uh, all of these great music producers uh, of the last hundred years that, you know, that he's, really incorporated and and to us who are just sort of superficially looking at the music we don't realize like all of this heavy lifting is going on in the background 
Yeah, I mean, I love that interview too. And, and like I said, I mean, this is this is what I love about these artists and intellectuals, right? Like they have a repertoire uh, that they study, that they work with, that we can't anticipate, right? Right? Because partly because they've been through so many historical changes and so many different settings, and they're idiosyncratic. I mean, you cannot anticipate them, right? Um, and even if it, you know, like if he went to the Berkeley School, it'd be a particular kind of train, but he right. didn't. And so then that becomes like more idiosyncratic, but in his own way. And then for him to like, for me, the flexibility and the openness with which to be yeah. an artist and, and you know, um, and the successes are not like, not like Hollywood success where you're like, you got cash, you got a staff and, you know, you, you don't have to worry about everyday stuff so much, right? If you make it, I mean, it's a, there's a constant hustle to it, right? Um, but I really appreciated. I mean, those are the kinds of aspects of Vietnamese culture. But you, you think like, okay, here's an old school Vietnamese musician, but like he's anticipating the issues between analog and the digital world, and appreciating the turn of vinyl. He's they're thinking about that already, right? And in some ways, they're the avant garde of like satellite television, and God knows it's like, and it's like the pay per view of like Mike Tyson boxing, right? Yeah. It's like. They saw it, they understood it, they intuited it, and they ran with it. And it became its thing, and they monetized it, and it became an industry. Um, you know, even like the Hong Kong films, right? Like, they are affected by that. We're all affected by that in a different way. But who would have thought, right? Like, we watched that, it's dubbed into Vietnamese, and we all loved it. I mean, we were, our childhoods would be different if it wasn't for those dubbed Hong Kong, you know, like, I remember the video cassettes. I love renting them for a dollar. Good story. You'd like, we'd binge on them, you know? And, um, but those are the things that really, I really appreciate of these artists and intellectuals and, and, and just people, everyday people whose histories we can't anticipate, who have so much complexity to them. It's just a matter of, you know, like you did, like just talking to them and, and listening to them. Um, and, they, and they anticipate the future for us in some ways. They make our present world so much better with their music and contributions and so forth. And so I think it's spectacular. I remember being a kid uh, in in before right before my teenage years, going into it, uh, being such a francophile when it came came to music, uh, and not really like going deep into it, but just really enjoying it a lot because, you know, we we heard it around our our families a lot, but following like Edith Piaf, right, mm -hmm. and it, you know, on a Saturday morning cleaning the house or cleaning my room for a few hours and putting Edith Piaf on. And then just imagining the French ca cafes that uh, all of these writers and intellectuals were like, kind of like hanging out at, by, by the, by the, by the riverside in, in, in Paris and, and coming up with these uh, in deep intellectual thoughts. And then listening to, for me, like Pam Zui and Jin Kong Sung, uh, bringing back these sort of nostalgic um, uh, modes of, of feeling and emotion. If we don't have those things, if we don't have those things as a as a culture, then it's very vapid. It becomes, you know, the 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 depth of of like our way of seeing the world mm -hmm. is very limited. Yeah, I mean, part of the, I mean, that music. I mean, the ways in which you know, this is you know, all great songwriters are like this, right? They capture so much in in a in a in a short, limited form, right? They have to comply to the, the beats and the notes and the scale of the music, right? And so they're remarkable wordsmiths that way to convey or to pick up a particular feeling of that time. When you listen to this music, and I remember for me, we clean on Saturdays too. I remember the tube, Pioneer tube amp, the speakers, yeah. and I'm still nostalgic for that because that's the one, you know, we lived in New Orleans and we had like flood insurance money Mm -hmm. And like, that's, that's, a, that was like the one thing that we, like my parents, like, you know, kind of paid a little bit more than they should have for. And, you know, th there's a particular sense to that, right? That, that feeling, it captures a particular moment, it captures a mood, a thought, um, and the complexities of that time, right? Like for me, like, you know, I love, you know, before I teach every class, we have like a, a soundtrack. And oh, wow. For each class, right? So wait, every class that you teach, you have yeah, every class that I teach, like it's a it's a it's a list. It's like a Spotify list. And the students, 
And this is, look, I'm getting old. I don't know the musical references. So I learn from my students, like what they're listening to, what they're reading. But we have this, like, we have this playlist. And, you know, I love introducing them like Cambodian rock, right? Like from the 1970s. And they don't anticipate it, right? They just don't anticipate that kind of music coming from this place, right? And the same thing with the, I mean, if you break down that music, right? The mix, the way that they edit that sound, the way they create that sound, you know, the acoustics versus the electric, you know, it's, it, that's the kind of stuff that's fascinating to me. And that, that's, that work still needs to be done. There's some people doing great work on that now, but there's still a lot of that that needs to be parsed out. And Southeast Asia was kind of kind of cool that way, right? Like it had this particular aesthetics that wasn't, you know, we think it's past and nostalgic passe, but if you look about it, it was like, it was like pretty cool and hip and the aesthetics were pretty cool too. And that's, that's the kind of stuff that I think is so great. And you, and, and you know, you go to, you go to Southeast Asia now and you can still, still feel it and hear it in the music sometimes. Um, and so I think, you know, there's so much to that material. It's a great history, right? Yeah, uh, I, I can't go into detail uh, with with this, but uh, there are filmmakers right now that are working on bringing those things back, recreating them, and you know, for us to see in story form. And they're coming. It's coming, and it's kind of coming in a in a massive way. That's pretty awesome. It the way they describe it is. Um, God, it's so beautiful. And it's in the hands of the best guys that uh, that are in the business. Um, that whole era of, uh, of music. And I, I don't want to even get into the details because I don't want to. <laughs> you definitely perked my interest, but yeah. Yeah. It's great. I mean, I love that sound. I love the feel yes. of it. I love, you know, the amp, you know, the, the kind of, when you guys are talking about vinyl, right? It's, right. it's, it's, it's like the, no, the background noise, the crackling, even that. Is yeah, different. and he said it. Zhuho said it has to be zaza, right? A little dirty. Yeah. Zha, yeah. It has that to particular be. ambient noise that has to be there. That has to be imperfect in some ways, right? It conveys, you know, a particular. But there's, there's a. For me, it's a sense of history, right? That we are able to kind of still live with, and it still influences, right? And and so, for example, like now, the the southern musicians influence so much right? The entire country. It's always affected the diaspora, right? But it, I mean, influence, not inf influence the diaspora, but now it's influencing the entire, entire country. And so I think that's, that's really interesting to see where that goes, right? As you're raising your children right now, um, do you find it hard to, or do you even put effort into giving them sort of these tools of appreciating your culture or even just nashville culture i mean i'll tell you right now i mean the kids are home for summer and all we've been doing is playing Finland, and so there's yeah. and so you know the, the the vietnamese card game yeah um 13 cards yeah i so we we were fortunate enough to live in vietnam you know right before covid and so they got a dose of that and the you know i cook vietnamese food with them and and I, I tell them Vietnamese stories, right? I tell them you know, stories that were influential to me, right? Like the stories of my parents departing from Vietnam, what it's like, what it what it is like to um, first for my parents to come to the United States, what it was like for me. Like, you know, they're going to camp now, and I never, I never, all I want to do is go to basketball camp, and I was never able to do it, right? Like we, we couldn't afford it. Um, and then to have them really, you know, my parents are 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 part of their lives and to have them understand where my parents are coming from and why things are different for them. Um, the languages that we speak, uh, I, you know, I, admittedly I've kind of slacked off on because of COVID like homeschooling and then, you know, cooking three meals a day to feed them. I've, I've, I've kind of slacked off on like, you know, speaking to them in, in Vietnamese. Um, but they know the stories we read. I read to them the folk tales, Vietnamese folk tales in Vietnamese when they were growing up. And so they still remember them. Um, and, you know, they're, they're, you know, we, and, and, you know, things that uh, I make them recite poetry, like my parents made me do. Um, and, and literature in general is a big, big part of our family. Uh, Wait, and, hold on. When, when, and, you, and so when you make them recite poetry, how much resistance do you get 
from them? Oh, it's a negotiating. It's a bribe. I bribe them with screen time. <laughs> it's like, you know, brilliant. Or Natalie Dickinson poem, you get 15 minutes of, of screen time. Uh, and, and they appreciate it, right? They they come to appreciate it. God, and, that's genius. You know, that that is that is partly like my parents did that, but I had to do that in Catholic school. So uh, to memorize certain things, um, and to me, and some of that stuff still lives with me, right? It does. Uh, it does. My my dad did the same thing to me. He, but it was a badge of 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 honor for yeah. for yeah. He made me re recite Latin. Uh, prayers and Latin chants, and I still remember them to this day. Uh, the yeah. old Tridentine Mass of, of pre-Vatican. Yeah, you, you were you raised Catholic as well? Yeah, I was raised Catholic. Yeah, I mean, what you know, I think that's really interesting because for me, part of me learning Vietnamese was would sit there, would fucking pray the Rosary all the time. Drill. <laughs> And, you know, they'd have the, all these like other, I don't know what else they added, you know, Vietnamese Catholics all, always add stuff, right? Like <laughs> masses are super long and all this stuff. I had no idea what I was saying. Yeah. But eventually I got it, right? Like I understood the tones, the rhythm, the meaning. And there's a particular aspects in which, you know, I asked my kids to like memorize some of these poems. They have no idea what it means. I don't care, right? Because eventually they, they, they'll come to it on their own, right? And, and this is like, it's a seeding and not like a mastery, right? And where this is the, the reverse of language and how we're taught with language nowadays, you know? And, and, and to not just read and interpret, but there is something where if you live with the language, the language will influence you. And the, and, and the language is not merely a re an expression of you or a reflection of you, right? But the language, influences you so this is why i love literature right like language itself is such a strong powerful entity a phenomenon that orders our world gives meaning to our world and so i think there's there's that to it and you know for me it's it's like learning vietnamese was like i, I you know i don't i don't pray now i don't raise my kids catholic at all my mom's always getting about going to mass but i have a thing for like the cap Catholic ritual where I appreciate that notion of it. Um, because without it, I can tell you right now, my, my Vietnamese would not be the yeah. same. You know, I, I never thought about that, but you're, you're 1000% accurate because the, the, my parents sat and broke down you know, mm -hmm. the gospel with us. We read it yeah, and we broke down the language while we were reading it. And yeah. you're right. Without the the Vietnamese Catholic tradition within my world, it, 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 there's no way that I would be able to. Whole, yeah, today. there'd be no excuse for us to like discuss with our parents. Like, yeah. you know, I didn't talk to my parents about my feelings. There was just right. no time for that. And there's no there's no room for that, right? And so, but the complex issues, abstract notions, right? Like, you know, I'd ask questions like, you know. Why would God ask Abraham to sacrifice his kid, right? Like, and I, I would, I would, we would ask those questions, and, and those are great stories. And, and to me, it's not so much. I mean, this is interesting because for me, it's not about Vietnamese per se, but it's it's giving my kids like a foundation of stories or a repertoire of stories that they can return to and compare as they go out into this world and and grow and change, right? so that they can understand and this is what home is right home is like home is a place where you go out to the world and you're like oh home could be different or home is good for this reason because it's different from this or home or being vietnamese is is limited because of this right and i think that's important to me is to give them a foundation um you know like you know eventually i, I want to teach them like the vietnamese alphabet and to have the pronunciation down and it's getting more difficult the longer I wait, but should they want to do that in the future it would be easy for them. Right. And so, you know, it, it, like I said, the world, you know, we, we live in a different place in a different context. My wife doesn't speak Vietnamese, so it's really hard for me to do it. Yeah, same as here. A, as a solo parent. Um, I think that's hard. Yeah. Um, and, and these are things that we have to negotiate, you know, and, and even when they go to Vietnam, they went to school and it was like, they didn't speak Vietnamese. Right. Yeah. You know, um, and so I threw him out with the neighborhood kids. It was funny because my kid kept going around saying, gone, you know, gone, wouldn't you to like his friends? And it's like, dude, 
and the kids would just crack up. And they would eventually just calm calm because that's how he, you know, that's their point. Talk to me. Yeah. Yeah. How you refer to himself, right? And you know, it's it's a great, you know, one of those great I've seen humorous grown, moments of language. I've seen grown men do that in the US. Oh really? Yeah. As they're in meetings with um people, they'll, you know, grown ass men, 30s. You know, they're just talk to uh, the people they're having meetings with in in at the table, and they'll be like gone, and they don't realize like <laughs> <laughs> the context and and how that's being played out. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a, a re another really interesting because those uh, person person reference aspects in the Vietnamese language is all about context, and you constantly have to read. I mean, that's what I love about the Vietnamese language, right? You're constantly reading. The person in front of you that you're talking to right so that's one thing that i really harp on my kids it's not in vietnamese in particular only in vietnamese but like when you know we're in the south and you know mr and mrs and all that stuff you know you could say that that is you know southern old school ways but i want them to understand right to read the context of the language mechanics of this right and so to me i mean vietnamese that is really important that way right like if we were to meet in person, I immediately want to judge, you know, is he my age? I am yeah. whatever, right? Like, you know, we could say Chukho now, but if I was to talk to him, I would immediately, my gears are like turning in terms of how do I understand that aspect? And so that dynamic of Vietnamese is not like just words or the tones even, like, but the socio-linguistic relationship that is being established by the language that, can, that I'm trying to teach. So there are different aspects of it that I'm trying to convey to them. There's a lot of jujitsu that happens too, for me, with the Vietnamese language. For example, there's people that are older than me that work for me, right? Yeah. And typically, you know, you issue commands in a certain way and you stay respectful, um, but you don't give out the, the super respectful things because you're still the quote unquote, the boss, right? Right. But then every now and then you want to show a deep level of grat gratitude for something that they just did. And yeah. you brought certain things and then you get this like reaction, like this fucking guy understands, you know, the language. He understands the subtleties of, of, of the expressions because, um, you know, when you say, when you respond something like telling somebody to ask somebody to do something, you do a great job and there's a way to, 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 to thank them or and then there's another way where in just daily conversation, when, you know, after like a, a tough sort of like we, we've gone through some tough things and at the end of it, I say, I write, Za -ang, and which is never coming out of my mouth, but they know when I say, yeah. yeah. And it's like the owner talking to right. people that work, it's still like this level of like a deep, profound respect for, for the yeah. job that you just did. And it's beautiful in its, its own way, the mechanics of that um, that language is, is such a, for yeah. me. And, but I, I know that there's a level of dubbing that's happening in that too, because they probably think that, you know, um, he's moved, he's emotionally moved so much that he responds this way, but it's completely unnecessary to do that too. Right. I mean, you are adding a different layer to yeah. that language and laying it on there, right? I mean, for me, when I was growing up, you know, the word toy, which is equivalent to I now. Right. And, and that has a lot to do with like the translation of the Bible actually. And then with the, with the, the present, the French colonialism, bringing the notion of, but what, when my parents, you know, Vietnamese couples, when, when, when they're talking to each other regularly, say, you know, some ang and am. Right. When my parents would get into an argument and it's like, toi, you know, <laughs> toi yet ang, you know, toi yet, you know, they don't say my or that, but they say toi, right. Um, as a subject. And I always, I never knew that it meant I <laughs> growing up. I just thought it was like, it was the angry self-reference for my parents when they got mad at each other. That's it. Until I read Vietnamese literature and I was like, oh, this is like, mm. this means I, you know, it can, it can mean I. Um, and so, the, I mean, those, those things are just really, they say so much. It does, so, it really right? does. And then even in, when you use toy, in business language or, you know, in friendships, it's, there's these different implications as well. It really is a beautiful language. Um, 
that has so much compression or mm -hmm. you know uh, it has so much uh, efficiency yeah in, in describing positioning and, and and feeling and subtle right some of it can be very subtle but it can be also very very you know when you might bow a person right it's it's two extremes right it's either you're very upset at that person or you're very close to that person yeah right it, it it's like the n-word in english right it's, it's yep. it, they're like you, you say it and you're the biggest asshole or you're part of an intimate community that can say that right? totally and you know i have um some celebrity friends vietnamese uh celebrity friends that you know you meet along the way and then at some point they start calling you my thou then you like oh my god the love yeah happens because he just switched over to calling yeah. me my thou and that's yeah. like a just a, such a different level of intimacy now we are we are no longer just friends right we are we are like deep homies we're we're yeah. really uh close at that point right. obviously i'm not calling him my thou because he's older but when right. he switches to that language to me Right. I realize, okay, this is awesome now. Now we're in a in a different yeah. we're in a different place. Yeah, it's great that way. I love it. You know, it's it's the it's those little aspects of language, right? That that I try to think about, and then I try to make my kids aware. And and you know, and that to me is interesting. You know, to me that that is more interesting than making because my my parents are always like making my kids gal gal. You know, they see their friends like gal ba gal on gal body, and and to me that's not as interesting as saying, hey, you know, uh, it's the context of the language or the person you're addressing that you need to figure out the footing of it right away. Yeah. We talk, it's the same thing with curse words, right? Like, you know, um, I don't ban curse words in my house or I don't, we listen, we listen to music a lot, a lot of music, a lot of outcasts sometimes, maybe too much. Um, but for me, it's like, okay, it's the context of language where I, I'm not going to be able to like, prevent you from saying a word in a particular place, but you need to understand what words or what situation is appropriate for you to speak. And so, I, I, you know, to answer your question, to get the original question of like, how am I trying to convey this to my kids? I, I think that's the biggest part of it so far. God, I can't, I can't wait to, to start to break down Tupac to my children. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, I think uh, it's all important because that's... <laughs> As funny as this is going to sound, but that's going to be my chin kung sung, you know, the way my parents gave chin kung sung to me. Did you give it to your kid? <laughs> Tupac is going to be my chin kung sung to them, right? It's so good, though. You know, and then there's there's lots to talk about, right? Yeah, because yeah. there's references to my neighborhood that I grew up in. Oh, yeah? Yeah, there's references to sort of like the, the, the kind of the environment that I kind of like witnessed and... Yeah. You know, lived around when I was growing up, you know, I had black neighbors to the left and to the right. I would yeah. go, um, you know, into their homes by myself. My parents didn't mind it. We'd go in, they'd serve me food and I'd hang yeah. out and, you know, it was a different smell, you know, it's yeah. a house. You know, there's cornbread and all this other stuff that was not in my house. It was very different uh, growing up. Yeah. I mean, I say that with, with me and Outcast. I mean, the Tri-Cities area, we grew up in an area where like, that's where they came from, right? That's the area where Atlanta rap came from. And, you know, that's a part of me growing up too, um, in a ways that are, that are like, again, unexpected, right? But are, are really significant. And they capture a particular aspect and time of, of that area um, and, and time period, right? And so I think, you know, to me, that, that music is important to me, right? Um, Very important, yeah. And you so know, that's, yeah. it, it, it's weird. All the guys on the East Coast are like, you know, Jay Z and Biggie, and then I'm, you know, Tupac and Snoop out here, and you're you know, just like the first like time I've like realized, oh, you're like outcast, and I get it. It's you know, I I don't know how you feel about East Coast West Coast rap, but I mean, the fact that you're talking about outcast is like I never thought about that. There's this actual other segment of Vietnamese people that yeah. are going to challenge me about their own, you know, American rap music, you know. I mean, there are some Vietnamese kids from New Orleans out there who's like, bounce is my kind of music. You know, it's like from New Orleans, right? It's like, okay, I got it. That's cool. Yeah. But that, that's what makes it interesting, right? Yeah. And and we don't know what kind of manifestations that, how that will play out, right? Um, it's, it's so interesting. And, and, you know, I do think that um, growing up in the South, 
I went to the West Coast for my 20s, came back to the South. Has it, it's a it's a whole different experience. I mean, when I hear you guys talk about you know being part of the film Vietnamese American film industry or how you guys know each other so well, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. So it's so different from from my experience, right? Like I don't have that many. I mean, just in sheer numbers, but it's made me think. It's made me think things differently or see things differently, right? That is not that is not similar to that. Um, and say that the East Coast, West Coast, and then you have like this pocket of like Southern music, right? That has its own thing that that will be there. And I think that's that's what's pretty awesome. But it has its own genius too. Out oh yeah, cast is fucking phenomenal. You know, I don't obviously feel the same way that you'd feel about outcasts, right? Like I'm not going to teach my children about outcasts because that's sort of like the, the, that's your genetics almost. Right. Right. And right. Tupac is my genetics and Snoop is my genetics. And Dr. yeah. Ray. And you know, so we're like my kids and I break down the Rosa Parks song mm -hmm. and then we're trying to play Hey Ya on the piano and trying to break down what that means wow. theoretically music, music theory wise. Um, and so that's, you know, that's, Probably of who it is, and, and you know they they by osmosis we live like a block off of Music Row here, <laughs> and you you talk about like studio musicians right with took hold, and the studio musicians in Nashville are unbelievable as they are in LA, um, and it, it's you know and and there's great like piano teachers for them and music wow. teachers it's just everywhere, and the music is good and um, like even the the vinyl stores are interesting jack white's got his vinyl stores in viking distance to our house right so um i hopefully the you know the kids will take advantage of that um because there's a lot of shit in the south and that's one of the few bright spots of it right yeah um so that's really important to me last question um i know there's not a black and, i'm not expecting a black and white answer but retirement vietnam or the u.s for you Hawaii, man. Hawaii. Did you say Hawaii? Yeah, I think so. There's a particular, it's, to me, it's like this, just so relaxing to me. And the history is so vibrant and the language is so vibrant. I love the history and it, it's it's a settler colonial history. It's, it's messed up. Um, but there's something about it that is so intriguing to me um, that that's what I'd like to kind of learn more about. Where in Hawaii? That I don't know. That I don't know. Um, I like the big island, you know, um, and again, it's like good seafood. Right? <laughs> like, <laughs> that's, a, that's a part of that too. But, um, you know, I've thought about Vietnam. I don't, I actually haven't thought about it that much to be honest with you um depends on you know like where my family is and what what benny's going to end up doing because we're three years apart and so i don't you know I, he's probably hasn't thought that far but i i do think about these things uh sometimes um wait 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 why does benny's why is he in the conversation or in the equation i just like where my family is at right like if i was to go to vietnam or go to hawaii it'd be you know, it'd be easy to get to LA to see him, you know, just to, to oh, so get a sweet man. Um, it's so sweet yeah. to, to, to know that and know that, cause you know, I have my, I have an older brother, just like, you know, Benny, I'm the younger brother. Yeah. To know that that's even, that makes me want to tear up. Like for you to even put that in the equation is such a sweet thing. Yeah. I mean, it, it's interesting, right? Because I think, I mean, I said that about home, like how Vietnam is Viet, Vietnam is like to be Vietnamese is to is like home where you like go away and you compare and you, yeah. you could rebel against and you could go to therapy for. But people come home to the place that they feel, I mean, they come back to where they feel most comfortable, right? Like for me, it's interesting. And I mean, if you said to me, you know, five, 10 years ago, I'm like, where do you want to live? I'd be like California, LA or Bay Area, right? Like right away, right? Um, but the South is, is what I know. It's like my waters, right? Yeah. And there's a certain aspect to that. And, um, I don't think Benny will ever leave LA, but, um, cause he likes it. I mean, he, I don't think he liked it as much at first, right? I think it's too quiet for him. Cause he's used to like big, like Ho Chi Minh city where people are out all the yeah. time. Right. 
and it's dense and it's lively and it's and people are out right um but i do think that there's something about you eventually come back right like there's a theme to all this like what goes around the world is round um a vietnamese filmmaker told me you know so what what goes around will eventually come back around um and so i think uh, you know, my sister's back in Atlanta now, close to my parents, and they're here. And not to say that this is the only decision I'd want to make, right? But there, there are just some things to, to think about. Yeah. Well, Ben, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And, um, you know, very open and, and such a warm conversation. Thank you today for this. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure to be on your show. And thanks for doing this. And I'm, I'm actually humbled to be a part of the lineup here. So thanks, man. Thank you for listening to The Vietnamese with Kenneth Wynn. The Vietnamese is produced by Brittany Tran. Special thanks to Jane Wynn, Catherine Wynn, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie, and Christo Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at The Vietnamese Podcast. You can also find us on YouTube where you can subscribe, like, and comment. Please rate and give us a review wherever you find our podcast. Thanks again for listening.